Welcome, listeners. This is Afrostoria, bringing you West African history and myths. This podcast can be listened to while you go about your business, but I hope you find the history interesting. When we talk about the history of Ghana, one popular empire always comes up in its history, the Ashanti Empire. However, while it will come up every now and then in this podcast, it is not the main focus of this episode. Rather, we will be looking at one of its neighbors that doesn't get a lot of representation in media and documentaries, the much smaller Fante Confederacy. Chapter 1. Bonoman and the Akan people as a whole. To give some background to the Fante Republic and the later Fante Confederacy, and by association, its neighbors, we need to look at the shared tribal history between all the kingdoms that will be mentioned before the Fante and the Ashanti even show up. The hardest information to get regarding the Akan of antiquity is that a lot of them used oral history instead of written records. While oral history is in itself a technique that can be mastered, looking through modern Akan writings, a lot of these records have come out in the form of prose and poetry, or have themselves been mythologized. Further hampering efforts is the various changes in the region seems to have destroyed a lot of the original stories that would have given more information. Looking at the language family, we can infer some of their origins. Their language, which they refer to as either Twi or Fante, depending on the tribal subdivision, is part of the Pututano subdivision of the Kwa language family, specifically the central Tano version of that group. This is all part of the Niger-Congo greater family of of African languages. This specific variant is restricted to West African nations such as Ghana and Togo, but it does at least indicate a long period of establishment in the region for the Akan people, absent of any other information present. What the old traditions seem to claim is that the ancestors of the Akan are themselves not native to Ghana. Browsing through the old traditions, they state that they used to be an upper Sahel people who migrated to the eastern parts of North Africa as the desert took away the once verdant forests of the northern Sahara. They initially settled along the Nile River close to the early Egyptian kingdoms, before being pushed out by early Pharaonic kingdoms, and then settling in the Nubian region. In the tales regaled by the Adwana clan of the Akan people, they fled Nubia in the 5th century CE due to events carried out by the Aksumite Empire near the region and moved towards Ghana, establishing several small states in ancient Ghana. The story goes that before truly settling in Ghana, they had established smaller trading states around the area near the borders of the Ghana Empire, which was not actually located in Ghana. Leaving the region after the decline of the Ghana Empire out of the 10th century before its fall in 1200 CE, the Akan people started to produce a lot of small trading kingdoms and towns in the region. The most notable of these kingdoms being the Kingdom of Bonoman, otherwise known as Bronga Hafo. This 12th century Akan kingdom is important for the main fact of the resource it was able to secure and control. Gold Mines Bonoman was able to have a lot of influence over other Akan states in the region, 
and became a great trading partner with the other great African empires that were in existence at this period. This also allowed them to exert a lot of influence and power in the middle of present-day Ghana. The Bonaman Kingdom would encourage trade with the smaller Akan states and seems to be accepted by historians from Ghana that this kingdom is one of the likely points of diversification from the Greater Akan tribe into the subgroups that all exist today. Bonaman was also located at a strategic point in the Trans-Saharan trade route, a trade route that circulated goods between Southern Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, East Africa, and West Africa. Their points lay between biomes of forest and savanna, and could provide the necessary beasts of burden that could better handle the savanna. Using their gold reserves, Bonneman was able to hire enough forces to keep roads to their city safe, making the city profitable. What is notable about the Akan city-states is that they resisted the influence of Islam, meaning that they were subject to the extra costs and tariffs not afforded to the Islamic kingdoms in West Africa. They were tolerant of Islam, but it would not be the dominant religion for them, as they wanted to assert their religious independence and stuck with the local faith for many centuries. Through this influence in the trade network, the Bonnermen were able to sell lots of leather, salt, and kola nuts in addition to gold as their main export. By the 14th century, Bonnermen spread its economic reach up to Côte d'Ivoire, and though there was a great amount of diversity among the Akan people, with the languages themselves breaking apart into their own distinct franca, Bonnermen still held a lot of sway. However, there were three main Akan subgroups that broke from the economic hold and moved into their own directions. These were the Asante, Fante, and Akwamu, and soon enough, they would wrest control from Bonaman as the dominant Akan states. Chapter 2 Portugal and the sparks of Fante unity. While Bonneman was thriving and doing research into smelting, the various Fante states were expanding southwards towards the coast of Ghana. There they set up port cities and began to trade as a middle point between kingdoms from locations as far away as Cameroon and Morocco. The beneficial location included not just the coastline, but a lagoon which meant larger ships could come to port within their cities and pass through goods. The various Fante kingdoms then made deals with Bonaman as a method to help ship their goods further down the coastlines of Africa, enriching the both of them. In the middle of the 13th century, one of these Fante states was able to reach enough economic wealth to become the dominant Fante polity amongst all the different Fante states. This was the Mankasing Kingdom. Reading through the mythology of its founding, the Mankasing Kingdom was founded in 1252 by conquering the native people of Adoa Kier. Once settled in, Mankasing found itself surrounded by a lot of enemy tribes and used the wealth that it gained from trade with Bonaman to finance a large army big enough to defend itself from all sides. These military companies were called Asafo, and Mankasim began to offer its services to all the other Fante states that did not have such a well-organized army. This meant that Mankasim became important among the Fante states and was starting to be the heart of Fante culture. One of the Fante-owned port cities that Mankasim regularly did trade with was a town called Anomansa, which became one of the most important cities on the coast for trade. One of the items they traded a lot in 
was the West African dwarf goat. These goats, often found in the forest areas, were bred to be adaptable to various climes and had a fast maturation speed. This meant that they could be shipped around quickly and raised efficiently, which improved the food stocks of many West African kingdoms that were in more arid environments. This was coupled with the salt trade from the Mali Empire, which brought a lot of profit and population increase to the various port adjacent African kingdoms. Regarding Anomansar, change would come in the 1470s when Portugal reached the coast of Ghana looking for trade. Anomansar denied the Portuguese access to their ports, fearing economic instability. What they did not expect was years later, in 1478, they found themselves unintentionally involved in the War of Castilian Succession. Trade near the town was too rich to ignore, and both Castilian and Portuguese naval forces clashed right outside of it. Thirty-five Castilian caravels tried to break the Portuguese fleet, but were driven back. The Portuguese then turned their attention to the town, which capitulated in 1479 during the Treaty of Alcacovas. With this, the Portuguese were able to build some castles near the town. This particular castle was called São Jorge de Mina and finished construction in 1482. With a lot of Portuguese and Fante now intermingling, a secondary town began to grow around the castle. The town merged with a Nomansa, renaming itself the town of El Mina, and began to trade heavily in both gold and slaves, which drastically changed the population dynamics of the area as the Fante in El Mina used this as an opportunity to get rid of their former aggressors by giving them to the Portuguese. These caught the interest of the Fon tribes in Benin, who would send a lot of their slaves to the El Mina market. By 1494, 22,500 ounces of gold and 12,000 slaves had passed through the ports of El Mina. Trade from the Portuguese also brought increased knowledge of smelting and blacksmithing techniques. Not all from Portugal itself, but thanks to the increased coastal trade amongst West Africa made faster by the large Portuguese caravels and ships. Higher quality goods and even artisans could make swift transfers. This has been observed from archaeological evidence from early 1500s Bonham and Craftwork as the techniques and styles of their ironworks underwent a significant change. By the early 1530s, the Fante town built a large dry dock, which allowed for the repair and resupply of ships. The various Fante states as a whole were growing in economic power and wealth, and most of their trade was still going more to Mancasim as opposed to Bonaman, weakening the former Khan's capital in, and its importance in greater Khan society. Mancasim made deals with the Portuguese for guns in order to help protect the trade, as other Khan and Nana Khan peoples wanted access to the coast and the Portuguese in particular. This meant that Mancasim had the job of holding the line against two specific interested parties in the region, the Aquamu and the Asante. These were still relatively minor kingdoms, a far cry from the infamy that they would achieve in later centuries, but they still wanted the wealth 
and with attempt to make raids throughout the 1500s. This prompted Mancassin and other Fante states to increase the size of their borders and form a loose military agreement between all of them, that if one were to be attacked, the others would provide assistance. This was not a true confederacy, as all the other states still retained a lot of their independence, but the sparks were there, and it managed to push away the other fledgling Akan states. This would temporarily turn away Asante ambitions, as by the time the kingdom formed, they would look to the north first, and in case of the Akwamu, those people turned their conquering gaze eastwards before trying to tangle with the Fante and the Portuguese. But none of these parties would consider another factor, the Dutch Empire. Chapter 3 Hammered from multiple sides, the Dutch, the Akwamu, and the Asante. The various Fante states were starting to enter a panic in the late 1620s. By this point, the Dutch West India Company was pushing the Portuguese out of the area, as the two empires continuously engaged in conflict. By 1629, the Aquamu initially made some forays into Fante territory, but was repelled successfully and decided instead to expand eastward. While this would seem that the troubles for the Fante were over, the fledgling Asante were making their forays up north in Ghana. This meant that for the Fante, they were starting to be surrounded on all sides by enemies, and that would ring true in 1637. A Dutch fleet showed up in Elmina, attempting to seize the port and battle the combined Fante Portuguese fleet. The Dutch routed the Portuguese and took over the town of Elmina. This violated a treaty made in 1624 between the Dutch and the Fante that was in the form of a non-aggression pact between the two polities. In response, one of the nearby Fante states, the Denkira, seized a lot of territory that the Dutch desired for control of trade routes in the Greater Khan territories. Without the Portuguese as allies, the various Fante states now had to deal with the Dutch on the same level. Though relations would mellow, as trade with the Dutch brought even greater profit to the Fante states. Relations with the Dutch included an exchange of ideas and the Dutch conducting anthropological studies on the Fante societies starting in the year 1653. We will go into a later chapter about the Dutch findings on the Fante governmental structure, but this is where the word confederacy was being bandied about in newspapers in Dutch countries and territories. This was not a true confederacy yet, nor even a republic, it was just a close alliance between all the various Fante states. As we get closer to the 1800s, we will talk less about the individual states and more about the greater society as a whole. In 1665, the Dutch relations with the British Empire began to sour completely and the Dutch feared for how this would affect their interests in what was known as the Gold Coast region. Thus they would try to negotiate an alliance with the Fante in order to have a military power on the mainland that was beneficial to them. While the Asante tribes were still fighting amongst themselves and the Akwamu were more amenable to the British trade, 
the one state the Dutch really wanted relations with was Denk Yira. While the Dutch were beginning to make peace with the Fante, a new and infamous Akan state rose to power in 1670. The Asante had been making consistent successful expeditions to expand their power, to the point they now were officially declared as the Asante Empire. Sensing the threats from this new power, Denkira engaged in war with the fledgling empire in the 1690s and succeeded in making the Asante a tributary state. For now, the Fante were safe from the Asante. This was helped by the other Fante states lending their support to Denkira and helping it in its other wars against the Asen and the Twifo, incorporating their territory. This emboldened the Dutch further, as in 1688, relations between the Dutch and the British allied Eguafo Kingdom soured over trade rights in the area. Since the Fante were involved in this war, it is important to understand the circumstances behind it and how the Fante states were dragged into what was largely a series of conflicts that took place between the British and the Dutch. In the port city of Komenda, another of the Fante states, an agreement had been made with France to construct a factory in the city. Near the existing British and Dutch factories, Komenda saw this as a bonus in order to gain technologies from the French that were not being provided by the other European powers in the area. The Dutch, incensed by this, marched a military force into the palace of Komenda and threatened the king of Eguafo to expel the French. The king of Eguafo rejected the threat, and in response, the Dutch sent bribes to the Asante, Aquamo, and neighboring Fante states to attack Comenda. France, however, got wind of this plot and sent counter bribes, which put the situation into an initial stalemate. Seeking a way around the situation, the Dutch made an alliance with the Twifo, another account subgroup, who were able to apply pressure on Komenda militarily. This resulted in the killing of the King of Eguafo, with one of the sons who survived the attack, who happened to be placed in a very Dutch leaning position, ending up on the throne and being crowned as King Tak Yi. While Tak Yi was officially ruling Komenda and the rest of the Guafo Kingdom, in reality, dominion of the kingdom was being shared by the Twifo and the Dutch, which Tak Yi was not fond of. Thus, he started sending out missives to the Fante states and the British to try and subvert both the Dutch and the Twifo. This led to a series of conflicts involving most of Lower and Middle Ghana, known as the Commenda Wars. We are able to gather a great amount of detail regarding the four Commenda Wars thanks to the writings of William Bozeman, a chieftain that lived in Comenda, and either was an observer or an active participant in the battles. So we have his records, as well as British and Dutch military logs, to give us a more complete picture. Though I warn that it is slightly more Dutch slanted, as Bozeman was more inclined towards alliances with the Dutch, and hated John Cabas, a key figure in the Commander Wars. So I will do my best to properly pass the information, along with the other 
information provided by other parties. Before getting into the wars, we need to talk about the most influential figure during the wars themselves, John Cabez. Thought to be born in the 1640s to a prominent African trading family that aided the British in trade negotiations, Cabez spent a lot of his life working at Fort Cormantin in what is now central Ghana. He sided with the British in 1665, when his father was killed by the Dutch when they attacked the fort. From then on, he maintained a position as a merchant prince in liaison to the British. Moving to Commander in the 1670s, he began under the supervision of another African merchant prince, only known to the records today as Captain Baker. Bacon's role as the main trade authority in the city would not last. Slowly, Cabez took over the slave trade and the munitions trade as well, until, by 1686, Cabez was the sole trade authority in Commenda. Due to his personal history with the Dutch, he made every effort to make trade difficult for them as much as legally possible. Cabez's power was so notable that after relations with the British aid, William Cross became sour in 1687, Cabez was able to have him moved back to Britain so that he could have a more agreeable liaison. Cabez's hatred of the Dutch would only grow when Dutch ships captured him and he was panniered. Panniering was the process of capturing a merchant ship and seizing their goods and holding the merchant for ransom. But in this case, it was a humiliation tactic intended by the Dutch to try and put Cabez in his place. When the British secured his release, he was likely incensed, as this is seen as the likely turning point for him attacking a group of Dutch miners. The Dutch retaliated in force, and Cabez made envoys to the British to secure more of Commander's ports and resources. The next impetus for the war was actually caused by a failure of intelligence gathering. British intelligence mistakenly reported that the Dutch were trying to send money in order to form an alliance with Dengira, when it was in fact the Twifo that the Dutch were trying to secure it with. The British made accusations which caused Dengira to indeed make negotiations with the Dutch, but the talks quickly began to break down between them until Twifo was the only party in the Gold Coast willing to back them in the event of a conflict. Matters worsened for the Dengira's opinion of the Dutch when they were caught kidnapping more Fante merchants. Dengira muscled themselves in and threatened to attack Twifo if they decided to back the Dutch instead of the English forces. Guns were finally fired on February 28, 1695, in what would become known as the First Commander War. The Dutch had attempted to land soldiers to reinforce their fort near Commander, but Cabez led his own regiment of merchant troops and the African soldiers routed the Dutch. Following the next day, the forces of Commander charged the Dutch fort, hoping to oust them from the Fante Hill territory. The Twifo were initially tense about coming to the aid of the Dutch because they were unsure if both Dengira and the other Fante states, such as Mankasim, would actually get themselves involved in the conflict. Needing more allies, the Dutch sought union with another Khan aligned state, the Cabez Terra, or Terra for short. This gave the Twifo the impetus they needed to fully support the Dutch in the First Commander War, and began their attacks on British forts, pushing back Cabez 
and his allies. Denkira, Mankasin, and the other Fante states did not take this well and marshaled a large allied force with the Acebo Kingdom and the encamped force of Commander, soundly defeating the Dutch and the Twifo Terror Alliance by April 28, 1695. From then on, neither side would engage in direct warfare. Rather, they would kidnap the merchants that belonged to each opposing faction, and would hold them for ransom. Realizing the futility of the way that things were going, the Dutch mainland tried to negotiate a peace treaty. However, things would be complicated by the commander of the Dutch fort, William Bozeman, attempting to kill Cabas directly. Based on Dutch missives collected from the Historical Records Office, this was done under orders as the Dutch felt that peace negotiations would be improved the moment Cabas was removed from the proverbial chessboard. This caused violence to resume until December 1695. The first commander war ended towards the end of December, but tensions were still swelling underneath. By the next time, the main flare-up would not have anything to do with Cabas or any of the British or Dutch forts. When we last left Taki, he had been nursing his own personal hatred for the Dutch, but things were not good within his own court. Taki had a cousin, known as Little Taki or Lesser Taki, who also had his designs on the throne. Although his name would change in later years, right now he would be known as Little Taki. Little Taki, however, was stationed at Elmina, but had made plans with the Dutch to provide support for a takeover coup. He commandeered a fleet to head for the ports of Commenda, confusing the British, who were initially ready to take up arms, but were inclined to stay their hands if the prospect turned out to be a minor civil war. What changed their mind was that Little Taki had set up seditionary elements within the city, which started attacking the British forts and places of commerce, while small Dutch ships also began to show up on the coast to join the skirmish. The original Taki, who we will be calling Greater Taki, called for allies, and the Akrons, which was another Akan kingdom, joined the fighting within a few days. The Akani and Adom kingdoms joined the side of Little Taki, intending to oust his relative from the throne, so that they could have a more amenable ruler to trade with. John Cabas, however, brought in his mercenary forces, and by March 20th, 1696, the forces of Little Taki were defeated. While the various Fante and Akan states stopped fighting, it was not uncommon for merchants to hear the British and Dutch forts firing at each other as people went about their day. With his merchant fleet proving a key factor and being able to have a seat at the table regarding the peace negotiation, Cabas was soon becoming both the monopsonist and the monopolist of Commenda. The Dutch were getting increasingly vexed by the situation, and decided that they once again needed a key ally in this fight. Thus, they decided to turn to Mankasin, Denkira, and the other major Fante states. They did not initially want to provoke full open war, but rather, one of the ideas was to apply economic pressure on Commander in order to undermine the rule of Great Ataki. The British were prepared for this and immediately put up counter-bribes for when the Dutch tried to bribe the Fante states. So the Dutch and the British were once again in a stalemate in the region. This forced both parties to come to a trade agreement. What neither of them expected was that both Greater Taki and Lesser Taki 
was shifting their individual perspectives on the European powers. Cabez and the British were growing increasingly concerned that the current ruler of Commenda was starting to favor the Dutch more, but were delighted that Lesser Taki was looking at the British more favorably. The British and Cabez initially disagreed on what to do specifically about Taki, with Cabez intending to apply economic pressure but the British instead ordered a successful assassination on Great Ataki's life. With the power vacuum now in place, Les Ataki, now known as Taki Kuma, tried to gather allies from Terra, Akani, and Asebu to march on Komenda in 1698. Gavis was not having any of this, and rallied his forces and pushed back the entire invading force, humiliating the British this time. Cabez was much less trusting now of the British and was reconsidering his views on the Dutch. In 1699, the fourth iteration of these conflicts resumed in November. Kuma was not going to stand for having the throne of Commander continue to be vacant, even if it was really Cabez that was running the kingdom now. Cabez started negotiating agreements with the Dutch, and now started to arrest British merchants to hold them for ransom, while the British would do the same in kind to him. But Cabez's hold over Commander would end in 1700, when Kuma led a force backed by the British, the Twifo, Terra, and Denkira. By the end of the year 1700, Kuma was now on the throne. There was an unknown threat rising that would start to affect all the various Fante states. While in 1704, Kuma would die, which would end up plunging Commander into another series of civil conflicts, the expenditures incurred by Denkira and his shifting alliances had weakened its position, and by 1701, the Asante were able to lead a successful revolt, breaking free of Fante control. Before any of the Fante states could do anything about the Asante, the smallpox virus brought by Europeans decimated the local Fante populations on the Gold Coast, making them not have the manpower to deal with the Asante. Allowing the Asante and the Aquamu to gain more massive power by the early 18th century. The Asante, better known as the Ashanti Empire, was finally out in full force. This ends part one on the Fante Confederacy. Thank you for listening to this part. Please like, comment, and subscribe, or even join my Patreon if you're so inclined. There you'll get bonus episodes for myths and even behind the scenes stuff discussing the writing process and even discussions with me on West African history. Next time, we will actually get to the formation of the Fuente Confederacy proper, since we've been doing a lot of the early lead-up. This is Afrostorian, bringing you West African history and myths, signing out.